Live from our studios in Kokom Lemle on digital address GA0992539. This is the home of fearless, credible, and independent journalism. Our lead stories Greater Accra Regional Health Directorate battles to save lives as they grapple with critical shortage of blood. United Nations urges Ghana government to ensure independent and diverse media which is free from harassment. We hear from the UN Secretary General as the world marks Press Freedom Day. Accra Regional Coordinating Council unwavering as they continue to demolish structures in waterways. Today, they turned their onslaught to Lashibi. We tell you more. The Pulse is brought to you by Global Communities Dignilu Affordable Safe Sanitation. Join us on GDSTV Channel 421 and GoTV 144. We stream live on YouTube and our social media handles. Welcome. Great to have you with us. In our first story, the National Commission for Civic Education, NCCE, says it will beef up education in areas like Kaswa, where issues of crime among the youth seem to be on the rise. Following the killing of the 11-year-old boy at Kaswa, allegedly by two teenagers there, a section of Ghanaians blamed it on the lack or low level of civic education and moral values. Speaking to join you during a visit to the newsroom as part of this year's Constitution Week, Deputy Chairperson of the NCCE, Kathleen Addy, said, among addressing other issues, that education will be stepped up to address the challenges in such communities. This COVID has helped us to be more innovative. We've become uh, more aggressive on social media. We are finding that we are able to get the attention of people. Most people are on social media now. We encourage people to follow our handles, all of them, NCC. If you type NCC into any of the, uh, of the, of the social media, uh, whatever, how do you call them? Yes, you will find, you will find, if you type in NCC, you will find it. Pages are very interesting, they're updated very regularly. And so we encourage people to interact with us. So actually, COVID has been a blessing in disguise, if I can put it that way. And because it has helped us to, you know, reach deep into ourselves and think about how do we continue to have an impact? How do we continue to meaningfully remind people of the Constitution without doing the normal things that we do every day? How significantly has that affected your core mandate of civic education, which is not limited by the, the Constitution Week? Yes, of course. Our mandate is not limited to Constitution Week. But our work goes on because, um, in fact, doing the COVID education even has been a core part of our work over the last couple of months. So, in fact, it hasn't... Um, it's, I won't say it's negatively impacted our work, it's just changed the way we work. And that change cannot necessarily be a bad thing. We still meet people, smaller groups, observing protocols, and even by doing that, we help people to remember that this is the way to live life these days. That, this, that today you don't enter somebody's office without wearing a mask. That today you don't um, go about without keeping your hands sanitized. So as we practice these things, as we continue to meet people, interact with people, smaller numbers, we probably think that we are even having a greater impact. And, and, and these innovations are things that we'll keep, even when we don't have to be uh, observing um, COVID protocols anymore, because we find that it's effective. How has it filled the resource gap? And we know that the NCC has always been challenged when it comes to resources. How has the dynamics changed because of this innovation that you talk about? Well, I mean, I don't know which state institution does not have a resource problem, and um, I don't like to dwell on it. But of course, like most institutions of the state, we have a, a, a financing challenge. Over the last year, you know, because of COVID or um, as a result of the difficulties of COVID, we've actually managed to attract a lot more resources from government. Um, yet last year, when we reached out and said, look, we, we need to do this work, because COVID is killing people, Eventually, we did get the resources that we need. We even got an upgrade of our fleet. Um, we were given 50 pickups and then 25 was taken back to the institution that lent it to us and we kept 25. After that, we've also bought, purchased a few more. So, like I said, it's been some kind of blessing in this guy because I suppose that it's brought uh, 
it's brought the need to keep a resor a, 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 an institution like NCC well resourced. It's brought that need to the fore. Because you see, if, if over the years our fleet was maintained by government in, government out, there will be no need to scramble around and look to borrow pickups to do public education. We would have already had a, a fleet that had been you know, steadily um, built up. But here we are, we are really, we're really at the bottom, nothing at all. So it is our hope that in subsequent years, every year, we'll get a bit of upgrade on the fleet, we'll get a bit more resources to do the work, so that when there is a crisis, we already have the capacity to be able to deploy um, the interventions that we need to keep ourselves and our country safe. What, what would you have to say about setting up your regional office, the new regional offices, following the creation of the new regions? Yes. We had reports from our correspondents showing that some of them were in a really deplorable state, yes. probably not set up. Yes. What is the update on that? Well, it's not just the regional office. We have many offices that are in a dilapidated state and we are constantly looking for ways to um, upgrade the offices, ensure that people have a decent place to work. It's a work in progress. The, the new regions require that we set up new offices. In fact, a lot of times our offices, uh, we share premises or the, 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 um, the local government will give us space to operate from or they'll give us a property that is not being used to occupy. And so, I mean, the regions were set up um, how many years ago? And we end up, so every regional office is set up. Maybe not all of them in the most ideal circumstances, but it's a constant work in progress to ensure that, you know, in a very short time, all our offices will be, um, will be, will be, will be 100% decent for, for, for human occupation. And we've seen uh, lately the issue of uh, content on TV mm -hmm. uh, following what we saw with uh, first the Gavin Polo and then mm -hmm. uh, with the money doublets as well, the NCCA coming in, uh, you know, cracking the whip. Uh, what is the role of the NCC in all of this? So, some have criticized you and said that perhaps you have not lived up to your mandate, which is why it is contributing to what we are seeing. Well, I mean, if NCC was resourced to um, do a lot more, we would have done a lot more. And I'll bring it to you, and I'll, 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 I, will, I will bring up you media people and the help that you can also give us sometimes. We went to the trouble of doing a whole TV production on Mamba Pa, the good citizen. You know, we, it was, a whole season was produced, you know, and it was so difficult to get it on air because everybody was charging us commercial rates. Now, if we all want to progress as a country, right, and the media will charge commercial rates for a product like that, that is meant to, I mean, not only provide educative content, but content that is also interesting and fun that people can connect with, you know. So we all have a responsibility. It's important that we, we recognize that, that as an institution, we do the best we can with what we have. But if we do not have support from key partners, like corporate, like media, then it becomes a problem. We cannot be um, as effective as we should be if we don't get that support. So I'm hoping that now that we can all see, maybe sometimes it takes a problem for everybody to understand all the different roles that we all have to play as, as, as citizens in a country. Now that all these things are coming up, we are hoping that when we come up with different ideas, different innovations, all these kinds of things to address the mindset issues that we all acknowledge as a problem in our country, we will get the support that we need from corporate to media to government and everyone else so that we'll be able to be even more effective. Looking at the magnitude of the problem we are faced with, can, can we expect any specific intervention from the NCC? I can only say that we will beef up our education. Fortunately, we have an office in every, every single district. Whenever there is a peculiar problem in a peculiar district, we make extra effort to ensure that you know, we come together and resolve that problem. Because you know, our staff also act as um, arbitrators and, and, and problem solvers in the communities in which they serve. So in fact, a lot of the reason why people don't even recognize the work we do is that we solve a lot of problems from escalating because we solve problems at the district level. You know? So this, for instance, I expect that our, our staff in the district where this happened or in the metropolis where this happened will be up to the task, engage the community, and do some additional education around the issues that have come up. Away from that, government has been urged to ensure an independent and diverse media free from harassment. 
Several Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Gutierrez, says in addition to the financial challenges facing media organizations arising from the COVID-19 pandemic, issues of abuse still persist. Now, the issue has been topical here in Ghana in the last few weeks, following a speech by statesman Sam Jonah on whether there was a return to the dreaded culture of silence. The world is today marking World Press Freedom Day. There's more in the following report. In April 2018, the Media Foundation for West Africa listed 17 instances where journalists were attacked within 15 months in Ghana. It includes the attack on joint news journalist Latif Idris, who was brutally beaten while on assignment at the police headquarters. One officer who was standing in front of one of the crowd control vehicles. I was inside the, the compound. Outside. Outside. In front of the main gate. I asked him if they have any special name for the crowd control vehicle then in a very rude manner he just he said in a can that I should just I should get off I got embarrassed so I turned and I was walking away and I said oh Charlie oh Charlie the oh Charlie I said was my offense he held my shirt, pulled me back, and slapped me in the face. He came and held me again. Who are you? I'm talking to you and you're telling me, oh, Charlie. And then pushed me to a crowd of police officers who had gathered in front of them. How many of these police officers? There were a lot of them. There were lots. Can you put a number to them? For those gathered in front of the headquarters, there were more than 20. So he pushed me into them. They didn't know what was going on between the two of us. But I don't know, they all started beating me, slapping me here and there. So I shouted and called him, Joel. Joel, he came and I asked him to start filming. He raised his camera and he started doing something. Some of them also pounced on him. Other incidents captured include an attack on a freelance journalist, Kendrick Offer, by soldiers in March 2017 during Ghana's 60th independence celebration. Two journalists, including an editor working with Modern Ghana, were arrested and interrogated by national security operatives in July 2019. Lawyer for the Modern Ghana journalist, Samson Ladi Anyanini, was unhappy. Our generation must stand up to be counted that the processes of the court and the powers of the state will not be used by certain individuals for their own parochial personal interest. You have a complaint about a publication, they put up an article. You call them, ask them to pull it down. They pulled it down. You are now looking for something to stick and say they have committed cybercrime. Ghana currently ranks number 30 in the World Press Freedom Index. In 2016, the nation ranked 26th. Media watchers say the current position of the nation is as a result of the attacks on journalists, many of which remain unresolved. A key case often referred to is the gruesome murder of investigator Ahmed Hussein Swale, who worked closely with investigative journalist Anas Arimianas. Ahmed was rushing, so he, he used the car to enter the kiosk. That, uh, uh, Salon over there. So he used the car to enter, and then the man went there again and gave him the last shot. So make it three, three gunshots. He followed him into the shot and gave him three gunshots. Ahmed was inside the car. Statesman Sam Jonah has been asking questions about whether the nation is returning to the dreaded days when freedom of speech was a rare commodity, the culture of silence. Men and women of conscience who write and speak words that penetrated the horse of power. It appears to me that in recent times, now for the Republican dispensation, the courage to stand up for the truth and the determination to uphold the common good seems to be missing. Now, at that moment, it is concerning that the voices of the intellectuals are receding into oblivion. Sadly, it is a consequence of deep partisan polarization of our country, said so that everything is seen through the lenses of politics. Now, the theme for this year's World Press Freedom Celebration is information as a public good. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says pressmen can only contribute information for public if they are free from harassment. The global challenges we have faced during the COVID-19 pandemic 
underlined the critical role of reliable, verified and universally accessible information in saving lives and building strong, resilient societies. During the pandemic and in other crises, including the climate emergency, journalists and media workers help us navigate a fast-changing and often overwhelming landscape of information, while addressing dangers, inaccuracies and falsehoods. In too many countries, they run great personal risk, including new restrictions, censorship, abuse, harassment, detention and even death, simply for doing their jobs. And the situation continues to worsen. The economic impact of the pandemic has hit many media outlets hard, threatening their very survival. As budget tightens, so too does access to reliable information. Rumours, falsehoods and extreme or divisive opinions surge in to fill the gap. I urge all governments to do everything in their power to support a free, independent and diverse media. Free and independent journalism is our greatest ally in combating misinformation and disinformation. The United Nations Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists aims to create a safe environment for media workers across the globe because information is a public good. Today, we commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Vinduk Declaration for the Development of a Free, Independent and Pluralistic African Press. Despite dramatic changes in the media over the past three decades, the Declaration's urgent call for press freedom and free access to information is as relevant as ever. Let's reflect on its message and renew our efforts to protect media freedom so that information remains a life-saving public good for all. Away from press freedom, scores of people are displaced after fire destroyed about 50 shacks at Asafubibi near Kokobod. Property where thousands of cities were also lost to the fire. Affected persons had to pass the night with friends in the slum as others did so in the open. And now Jima has more. A fear poker is a relative of the deceased. She arrived a few minutes after the charred body of the teenage boy was conveyed from the scene. She weeps uncontrollably. The auntie says the deceased has ignored all cautions against living in the slum. She says he lived at Atosu with his father, but he joined some friends and relocated to the slum. His father told me today he received a call that his son is dead, so I came to confirm. About 40 sharks were bent completely by the fire. The fire is suspected to have been started by a couple who were cooking with a coal pot. The area is known for pillow production. The cotton raw material is believed to have ignited the flame. Here are some eyewitnesses. Some people were cooking somewhere in the middle of the affected portion. That is how the fire started. They are drug addicts. They refuse to listen to any advice. Let's go to Kumasi now and talk to Nane Aojima, who has been following the story. Now, Nane Ao, has Nadmo visited the affected victims? And what are they saying? The question I have is that um, yesterday, Nadmo came to the field um, after the incident to gather some um, information from there. But victims are yet to get any relief from the National Disaster Management Organization. So you reported that the people had to spend the night with their friends in the slum. How are they doing now? This morning when um, I returned to the slum, the people um, I, I, I got in touch with also told me this evening they might be forced to do the same because a lot of them have lost almost everything that they owned. Um, these people are people doing many jobs uh, in, in the slums, and some of them have traveled from various um, areas of the country into um, Ashanti region and living in these slums and plying their trade. So if they have nothing uh, now, some of them tell me um, they have no relatives in Kumasi. So it's either um, friends extend the invitation to them to pass the night or they continue to, um, to, to sleep in the open. They were hoping that the National Disaster Management Organization could come to their rescue, at least make some tents for them so that 
they could pass the night in these tents, but um, it seems um, that it's not coming now. So a lot of them will be forced to, again, spend the night in the open. That sounds terrible, Nanao. And um, do we know what caused the fire? Um, the fire service have started investigation into the incident, but um, as of now, they've not been able to establish anything yet. So um, even though they've, they, they say they've concluded, they've concluded with the firefighting and also um, um, initial um, investigation into the cause of the incident, they are yet to give us um, what exactly caused the fire. What they say is that the people who they need to interview, they, they've done that and um, the investigation continues. So hopefully, um, as soon as possible, they will give us their findings. Beyond that, more has any city or regional authorities come to the people's aid? As of the time I left the area, none of the city authorities have um, been to the area. So we're hoping probably in the coming days or um, later today, somebody will visit them and listen to their concerns. Manay Aljima there joining us from the Ashanti region capital, Kumase. The Paramount Chief of Wungu, Nazori Saka Sulemana, in the West Mampushi Municipality of the Northeast region, has authorized a manhunt for a group of armed residents who attacked and killed a bull elephant. The chief has been angered by the refusal of the residents to heed his warning not to harm the animal after its presence in the area was brought to his attention. The chief has therefore ordered the residents to stay away from the carcass as attempts are made to report the incidents to the health and the forestry services in Waliwali. Ilias Otanko reports. The animal was killed Friday afternoon near a small stream outside the villages of Palu and Misiu, about 15 minutes ride from the Wungu town. It was still not clear how the elephant was murdered, as none of the locals at the scene was willing to speak to us. However, it was gathered that the animal was cornered by not less than 20 armed men who fired from different directions as it attempted to flee a small burnt forest in the area. At the scene, the animal was slaughtered and its head, including the ivory, taken away by the killers. The rest of the body was severely riddled with bullets. The assemblyman for Wungu, Alasa Nasiru, who spoke on behalf of the paramount chief, said the chief is furious over the matter because the residents chose to disregard his warning against the killing of the animal. It was yesterday in the morning around 8.30 thereabout. We was in the palace when we hear that there is an elephant crossing Yama Road. So they called Nanzoa to inform chief, the paramount chief of Wungu. So he told them they shouldn't touch it, they should leave it alone. So by a few minutes time, we hear that it is in Mishu. So they recall again and he said nobody should touch it, they should leave it alone. So wherever it is, it will go back to where it is. He don't allow anybody to do anything to it. So later on, around three thereabouts, we hear that they have a group of people came and shot and buried. So, and the paramount chief of Wungu traditional area give authority that they shouldn't touch it, nobody should touch it. Once he said they shouldn't kill it and they refuse and done that, they should leave it alone. I think that is why it's lying down since yesterday to this time. The assemblyman also said the chief has ordered the search for those behind the killing. At first of all, he was looking for those who have killed it. He didn't get. So because of that, they should leave, they should leave it alone. We didn't even see a person who said they are the group of people who kill it. Because according to them, yesterday when you come here, the time they were here, the guns that were shooting is about 20 or more. So they didn't even actually know who killed it. And they don't want to even tell actually who done that. He said attempts were being made by the paramount chief to contact health and the forestry services in Wale Wale to report the matter. Because according to him, once it is like this, we cannot leave it alone. We have to give the forest people I mean, notice to also come and observe it. But fortunately, when this is Saturday, when we go to the office, nobody is there. 
The scene of the incident was literally a tourist attraction as dozens of the locals from far and near thronged the place to have a look at the killed mama. While many came with the intention to get a share of the meat, others came just to watch and take pictures on their mobile phones. The assemble man, however, had this message for the crowd gathered at the scene. So, guys, all those who are not supposed to be here are to leave immediately. You have been asked already not to come here. After this announcement, anyone who refuses to leave should have themselves to blame for any ramifications that might come upon them. Some of the residents spoke to Joy News. Uh, we all hear that uh, elephant have been shot and dead at Palu, here we call it Palu. So all of us were here to witness and to see it. Some of us have never even seen elephant before. So in fact, when we hear that, it was very amazed to everybody. So we're all here to see how elephants look like. And we have, have never seen elephant, elephant before, before. So, so we are here, here to see it. Elias Tanko reporting. Meanwhile, the Wildlife Division has begun a series of measures to retrieve the ivory of the bull elephant killed by the residents at Wungu in the West Manpushi municipality. Joseph Benlila is Regional Wildlife Manager for Northern Ghana and he joins us via Zoom on this. Tell us why, first of all, we are retrieving the ivory. Good afternoon to you and to your cherished listeners and viewers as well. Yes, um, the story is, is true. Um, an elephant has been killed very painfully in the West Mampurisi uh, districts in the uh, Northeast region. And so, yes, um, uh, it is uh, an offense indeed to, for anyone to kill an elephant in this, in this country. Uh, the Wildlife Conservation Regulations uh, allies, you know, 765. Uh, uh, of 1971 prohibits uh, the hunting of um, an elephant, uh, particularly the fact that an elephant is classified as a wholly protected or uh, you know species, and for that matter, it enjoys very strict uh, conservation. And so, yes, uh, we would have to go all out to ensure. Unfortunately, our connection with Mr. Beninla is failing us at the moment. We will try and re-establish contact with him so we can have a fuller conversation. But the story, of course, is that an elephant has been killed at Wungu in the northeast region. And wildlife authorities are currently um, going to retrieve the ivory from the elephant's corpse. We now have Mr. Beninla um, joining us. Sorry, sir, we got cut off earlier. Uh, you were telling us why exactly we are just retrieving the ivory. Yes, um, what I was saying in a while ago is, is that uh, it is an offense for one to kill an elephant in this country. It's also an offense for anyone to, to be in possession of any part of an elephant, be it, it meat or the tusks, you know, or the ivory. And so, yes, we would have to go all out and uh, ensure in the first place that uh, those criminals who want to, to, to the extent of killing an elephant are brought appropriately to, to book, they are prosecuted, they are arrested and prosecuted, and then the task that, uh, you know, is likely to be in their possession is also retrieved and then taken, you know, in possession uh, to the Forest Commission. How will the body of the elephant be disposed of? Uh, well, unfortunately, when we got wind of uh, the crime and got to the scene, uh, the carcass had already been dismembered and then, you know, taken away by, by the people who were there. And so, yes, we, we didn't find any, any, any carcass there to retreat. Right. We are looking at live visuals of the carcass at the moment. Where is it now? And are your men on their way to pick it up? What I said a while ago is that when we got to the scene, we mobilized myself and my men. We mobilized and got to the, the scene uh, yesterday, the crime scene yesterday. And as at the time we were there, the carcass had been taken away. The very carcass we are looking at now? It, it, it was dismembered. 
Okay. And take, take in, taken away. We didn't right. find any meeting away. Do we know how this elephant ended up in Wungu? Yes, historically, uh, the area has been the migrated ground for, for the African savannah elephants that we have in, in this country. Uh, previously, they will migrate, if you know the geography of the area very well, they will migrate from Burkina Faso uh, down to uh, the Upper East region, where we call the Eastern Wildlife Corridor, uh, Binduri, Zungoiri area there. Then, eventually, they exit through the Gambaga Scarp and then, you know, use that that stretch of, uh, you know, habitat to, to the Mule National Park. So it's been their, their you know, migrated grounds since time immemorial. And so we are aware of the grounds, we are aware of their presence every now and then in the area. So it's not uh, unexpected that uh, elephants were found in the area. If it's not unexpected, why has no protection been um, created for these persons, for these elephants. We know their roots, we know what time they will be there, what time of the year at least. Why isn't an effort being made to ensure that Unfor they are indeed protected? Unfortunately, in as much as uh, we know that it is their, their migratory route, we are not too uh, sure the exact time that they will pass. They are wild animals and foragers and when they want to forage. But the fact of the matter is that we, we are strongly on the ground, if I say we, staff of the Wildlife Division of Forestry Commission, we are strongly on the ground. We have informant network everywhere. And so, yes, that is the system we're using to manage the migratory movement of these elephants. Mind you, uh, these are not domestic animals uh, whereby, excuse me, say, we will be heading them as we would have done to cattle. No, we, they move freely. And then we, we use our intelligent network system, including uh, drones, surveillance to monitor their movement every now and then. Yeah, well, um, they do move freely, but we know that largely they move around along the same routes and every year, as you yourself mentioned, that uh, this place has been known to be a place where uh, a migratory route for elephants. So I, I just find it difficult to um, wrap my mind around the fact that we do not know where they will be and when they will be there, when indeed we are doing geo-surveillance for these animals. You see, it depends upon a particular period within a season. When there is enough water, you don't find them moving every, I mean, very often. But where they find it difficult to get water, to get the herbs and the fruit and leaves that they will leave their feet on, indeed that makes them to, 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 to move longer distances and perhaps faster than they would, have, they would have moved. And that is why I said earlier that it's difficult to predict their movement exactly, but we are always on the ground and then using our inter you know, intelligent network system. But let me also say, your listeners, that uh, it's not strange that they found, I mean, the people in the Wungo area found the elephant there. They are very much aware that elephants have used the area, they have migrated within the area, they have foraged the area for their su survival and sustenance. And so, yes, the people who did that did this consciously you know, for a purpose. Other than that, uh, it's not strange for them to have said that, well, this is a strange animal, maybe let's go out and, and kill it. No. In as much as we are aware of their movement, they are also the traditional authority, are also the people there are also aware that it's a migratory route for, for elephants. And indeed, when we were in the area, there's nothing to show that the elephants uh, threaten anybody's life. There's nothing to show that it's one to do anybody's farm to read, to read cross for which region there was the cause for it to be gone down. No. Yes. None of these things happened. Right. So, yes, 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 exactly. Uh, Mr. Bin Ninla, thank you very much for joining us. We'll come back okay. to Accra, and the Great Accra Regional Minister, Henry Korte, is vowing not to relent until all buildings in waterways are demolished. As the rainy season nears, the minister is teaming up with the various district assemblies to raise down all such facilities to prevent the occurrence of flood in the capital. On Monday, the minister led a team from the Tama West Municipal Assembly to demolish a three-bedroom house in La Shibi and also a car wash in Bay. My colleague, Rico Asante, has more. Shaibu Kabore is assemblyman for the Lashibi electoral area. He watches on as his three-bedroom house, which he says cost him hundreds of thousands of cities, is raised down by the Tema West Municipal Assembly.
To prevent the recurrence of flooding in the region, Regional Minister Henry Corte is teaming up with district assemblies across the region to demolish houses and facilities constructed in waterways. A washing bay and this three-bedroom house is now gone, but owner and assemblyman of the electoral area, Shaibu Kabore, says he accepts that he did wrong by putting up the facility in a waterway. So it's one of the errors we do, and uh, I accept that um, it is a wrong thing we, uh, we uh, have done, and then um, I will use this as a leader, I'm using this as an example to others, to serve as a deterrent to others. Let us not take the law into our own hands, especially the local leaders, the opinion leaders. When you are in your locality, don't think you are above the law. Um, leadership by example, let's live by it and then um, make sure we do the right thing. So I try to let it go and then as you are witnessing it is gone. So that tomorrow the town will not be flooded and then we will lose life and later an uh, assembly member who is the local leader of the area will be accused for blocking the water and then uh, disaster happens. So I think it's, it is better we let some of these things go. But the Greater Accra Regional Minister Henry Corti is warning that more of such demolitions will happen across the capital. I'm saying that some people said, oh, any fee, oh, to me, yeah. Well, the train has taken off. So long as you remain a passenger, when we get to your place, the train will stop and it will pick you. Sorry, it will pick you. So, well, it's your choice. If you choose to build on the waterway, when we get there, the train will stop and you can be rest assured that it will not leave without picking the passenger. So this is just to serve as a deterrent to all. That when we get there, we will indeed get there. And we will, we will do what we have to do. But in the same vein, let me use the opportunity to commend the assembly member for demonstrating high leadership qualities. Now, the Greater Accra Regional Minister, Henry Quarte, added that his outfit is waiting for a report from the police on the Christ Embassy Youth Church program that drew public criticism for violating COVID-19 preventive protocols. The uh, police service has issued a statement, and let us be guided by that. As the chairman of RESEC, we are waiting for... Investigations are ongoing, and we are waiting for the report to get to us, and an appropriate time will speak to you. In the meantime, today... The police are along the beaches to ensure that uh, there is strict compliance to the COVID safety protocol. But as I said, uh, investigations are on its way and surely a uh, report will come to the RCC and then we'll act on it. You're live on The Pulse here on Joy News with me, Daniel Dazi. Still coming up, health facilities in the country, especially in the Greater Accra region, are struggling to save lives over a shortage of blood the blood bank. Stay with us, we'll be back with more. You're welcome back. This is The Pulse. Uh, we continue with our bulletin and health facilities across the country, especially in the Greater Accra region, have been struggling to save lives because there is no blood at critical times. That's according to the Ghana Health Service, which says health workers are heartbroken when they see patients who could have survived die due to blood shortage. Data for the 2020 maternal death causes indicated about 44% of maternal deaths were due to obstetric hemorrhage. This means about 5 out of every 10 maternal deaths could be prevented if there is sufficient blood at any given time. Now, beside pregnant women, accident victims who come in with a lot of blood loss with no relative to donate or mobilize blood become victims of all casualties for lack of blood. Now, the, the volatile condition that existed has been worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic, resulting in more preventable deaths than usual. The Health Promotion Unit of the Ghana Health Service, Greater Accra, is launching a campaign to address the problem of blood shortage. It is themed, Love a Mother, Save Her Life, Donate a Pint of Blood Now. Joining us in studio for this discussion is Mrs. Eunice Joan Teen, uh, Joan Te Jagley. She's the um, 
Greater Accra Regional Health Promotion Manager at the Ghana Health Service. Ma'am, thanks for joining us. Um, tell us, how bad is the situation now? As you just mentioned, blood is critical in life saving, especially in our facilities. This has made it an international day being observed by the whole world. That tells you that blood is very essential because with the blood, even those with life-threatening diseases can have a longer life and then be able to live a, a, a healthy life with their condition. And as it has happened from last year that we are struggling with the COVID, where gathering and then a normal life had become a thing of the past, uh, those who usually come for blood donation voluntarily have also not been coming. And uh, the programs we organize to mobilize the blood is also not in progress any longer. As a result, uh, we barely getting a quarter of the blood we need to save life. And uh, with this, as you just mentioned, we are losing a lot of uh, uh, people that should have been saved to enable them to continue with life and be source of hope to others. So the situation actually is very bad in all our health facility. And you and I can attest to the fact that we are even having a lot of accidents these days. And as you just mentioned, five out of every 10 deaths recorded maternally, that's maternal death, is as a result of loss of blood. So if we have sufficient, it means we can save five people from 10 before we try to do the other needed to be able to save the rest of the five that have other causes uh, for dying from childbirth. In fact, we should all applaud when no woman die as a result of giving a new life. So if we are losing five women, some who even lose their children in addiction, and uh, some they deliver their children are alive, mother is not alive to take care, uh, you can imagine the effect of that on the child raising. And uh, when it comes to other uh, surgical procedures that need blood, you can imagine what is happening over there. If for maternal death alone, we are having five being lost out of uh, uh, 10, right. then right. You, can, you can imagine the... Right the seriousness of the situation. It, it, it the seems time. quite serious. So if someone wants to donate blood, mm. what do they do? What's the process that they pass through? If you want to donate blood, you can walk to any health facility and uh, tell them you want to donate blood and we take, the, take you through the process, do some medical check on you to find out your level of blood, your pressure, and the other checks, even some health condition to ensure that when you donate, you don't put your life at risk. So after those processes, if you are fit to donate, then you now be given the opportunity to donate because we are very conscious of the fact that you didn't go trying to save a life and will lose your life either. So we want to ensure that everybody who donates blood is safe after mm. the donation. And uh, you know, uh, when we talk about blood donation, people think when you donate blood, you die. There are benefits of blood donation to the individual who is donating. In the first place, you knowing that you are saving a life is very important and you feel happy you have saved a life. That one is emotionally satisfying, but we know that it helps reduce the store of iron in the body, which can also reduce the rate of a, a heart attack. And uh, it helps you, you see how trees, when they overgrown, they are not able to bear uh, fruit well again. The same way when you keep your blood mm. in mm. you for long, mm. it doesn't give you the best of uh, protection and the potential you need. So when you donate, it's like pruning a tree. It comes with a fresh blood, a, a fresh blood, and then uh, it gives you healthy life than it used to right. be. So with right. that, you yourself, you benefit from medical check that you didn't pay for. 
it helps you refresh and then renew your blood system. It reduces the storage of your uh, right. iron level right. that can cause um, a heart attack. And besides that, you also save not only one life, because that individual who had the opportunity of taking your blood is a source of uh, social, psychological, physical to so many other people. So you save so many other people besides the individual you've given the mm. blood to. So mm. that alone should be a joy and a, a some motivation yeah. for us to ensure that we give blood to those who need it. And you know, in the world around, we are, the world is trying to move away from paid blood donation to voluntary blood donation. It means therefore that if I don't have money to bring somebody to come and donate and I'll pay for, I'll lose my life. While somebody is walking around with excess blood that will not be of any benefit to the person, but can save my life. That is why the World Blood Donation Day had been instituted by World Health Organization. So help me understand this. If I, um, maybe a family member is delivering a child mm. and we bring in someone to donate blood, we have to pay? No, please. If a family member or you are going for a surgery and you bring somebody to donate blood, you don't pay. But what happens is if you are coming and you don't have anybody to donate the blood, there are people who have contracted themselves who are ready to donate, but they only donate with a fee that if you pay me this much, because I have to go back and take care of myself. So they use it as a business. So if you are in need and you don't have anybody to donate, then you have to look for those people to come and donate and you pay them. And sometimes what happens is, if it happens like that, they may not be able to get the particular blood because some of the blood groups are scarce. So if you are not able to get the particular blood, then you'll be stranded and before you get it, maybe your person is gone. But when we have more people donating voluntarily, and we have sufficient stock, it means we we'll have all the categories of blood we need. So at any critical point, we'll be able to give out. I understand. I, yeah. I, what, I want to, what I'm asking is because we do have some reports with evidence that some persons went to donate blood mm -hmm. when their family members needed it, mm -hmm. and they had to pay at the point of donation as much as 150 CDs. For their own donation. Yeah. Uh, that one, I would say, is not in place. And, uh, you know, the only thing for which sometimes the team is um, stranded, for which I don't know, I, I can't justify it, is because of the, the items they use for the blood bleeding, the sac, the chemical, the test, and so on. But that should not go as much as that. But there are some overhead costs in assessing the blood. You, they have to do some tests for you to find out whether the blood you are donating is worth giving to the person. They have to check your health condition. And you know all these tests have some uh, financial uh, weight on them for you to be able to... Aren't those finances taken care of by the, health, by the kind of health service or by the government? Who would take care of it if you are donating blood? Who will take care of it? Nobody will take care of Who would the cost be shifted to? But as to how much the total cost is, that is what I can give you offhand. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. So that might be the reason why. And you know the sack has a chemical in it. That chemical is also a cost. Uh -huh. But, well, but when all, you all are the coming same. to donate voluntarily, eh, you are not paying anything. Because the system then absorbs it. You are doing it on your own volu uh, voluntary. And uh, we don't need to charge you for the cost to be able to get the blood available right. for others right. to use. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, um, exactly. Um, so that's the message there. You don't pay when you are donating blood, but um, you should go out and donate a pint today. Now, we are counting on your usual cooperation, and we're looking forward to seeing you at the hospital sometime. You're live on The Pulse here in Joy News with me, Daniel Dazi. We'll be right back. Stay with us.
You're welcome back to The Pulse. Now, teachers at Amankwetia MA Junior High School in Kumase are compelled to contribute to the purchase of electricity for the running of the school. Headmaster Frank Kwachi bemoans the impact of power cuts on academic work, especially in the efficient and effective operation of the ICT center. He has appealed to the authorities to help end the challenge. Mahmoud Mohamed Nuruddin has more. In our offices, in our various ICT rooms, we need electricity to function. And at times, teachers are forced to contribute from their pocket in order to buy electricity to finance school activities. I've seen that major stakeholders have met here, and I'm confident they will help us solve some of this. No, no. No head teacher or no teacher can collect even a CD from a child for a school project. Therefore, PTA, as for you, you are an association. You can even move the teachers out and you, the parents, come around. Let us also contribute our quota and make things done. So the parents, the SMC, let's come together and do something for our own children's sake. Mr. Kwachi spoke to the media at the commissioning of refurbished school block. The school has 15 teachers, four national service persons, and 240 students. Eight performance at the basic education certificate examination has significantly improved over the years. But the main challenge was the deplorable state of the school block. The headmaster's office, staff common room, and entire block were in a deplorable state. It took the intervention of Mr. and Mrs. Jackson to come to the aid of the school. We started by asking the mason to patch up broken up steps and so on and so forth. We've renovated all classrooms. We've put up marker boards in all classrooms. The headmaster's office staff room has been refurbished. And as I stand here, I must say that our sole interest is not in the building, but in the transformation of lives. <laughs> Jesus Christ came on this earth not to seek buildings, not to seek beautification, landscape, or not to purchase articulated trucks and buses, but he came down for humanity. Has not only brought hope, but also put smiles on the faces of Headmaster of Amankwatia, M.A. Junior High School A, Frank Kwachi commended them for the support. Those who knew the state of this particular block will always appreciate and encourage others to emulate what you've done today. With great honor and pleasure, the management, staff, and students of Amankwetia JHS welcome the 1999 year group, also known as the elite group, and all other year group present to your alma mater. We say welcome home. I am extremely happy because there is a family through whose efforts a school has been transformed. And immediately I entered here, what actually motivated me and uplifted my soul was the way the school has been transformed. And again, looking at the trees that have been planted, the landscaping. It means that somebody has bought into my vision of keeping the city clean and green. Please, let's encourage the teachers to work hard. Normally, when someone is working hard, all of a sudden, they will transfer the person. We won't do politics here. Mrs. Jackson called on Ghanaians to contribute to quality education by enhancing the environment for teachers and students. She urged the entire school body to inculcate maintenance culture to keep the school safe. Stakeholders of the school expect improved academic performance with the enhanced learning environment. A report by Mohamed Nuruddin.
Now, despite various road safety campaigns in an attempt to reduce motorcycle and vehicular accidents on our roads, the menace continues on a daily basis with varying degrees of injuries and effects on victims and families. We bring you a sad story of a 22-year-old mobile money vendor at Dodi Papasi in the KGB district of the Oti region. Prince, the victim, is currently paralyzed from his waist to feet after a motorbike he was riding on had a front tire burst and some assaulted. Prince is on admission at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital but is unable to do anything for himself, especially the daily help, except for the daily help from his mother. He requires emergency, emergency surgery to correct the defects, which would cost him over 40,000 Ghana cities. Peter Senu has more. The 8th of September 2020, when Joy News visited the Dodipapasi community to speak to residents about their expectations going into the December 2020 elections, Prince was one of those who volunteered to speak. He said, among other things, that... We are in the village now and nothing is going on better. As you can see, we, are, we have completed the set about four or five years now. We are still in the house. So what are you doing? Now I'm just a vendor at station. Can you imagine? Credit transfer, okay. mobile money, yes. About five years now, I'm still under this umbrella, hustling myself all the way. Prince, according to the mother, started operating as a mobile money vendor after senior high school over three years ago to save some money for his advanced studies. Prince, we are again told, is hardworking and favorite among his peers. The 22-year-old is currently on admission at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital after a motorcycle he was traveling on from KGB to do the Papasi had a front tire burst and some assaulted. The accident, which occurred two weeks ago, left Prince with a spine injury and a broken rib. He is paralyzed from waist to feet and unable to do anything for himself except the daily support from his mother. Prince requires emergency surgery that would cost him over 40,000 Ghana cities. This has been the difficulty for the family over the past couple of weeks. The single mother says she does not have the financial strength to push through this difficult time. Prince's mother, Annie Deku, has been speaking to Joy News. Vinya Prince. My son Prince had a terrible accident last Wednesday and I sent him to the Papasi Hospital but we were referred to a bigger facility. I am required to pay 40,000 Ghana cities but I do not have that financial strength. Prince was the one looking after me until now. I am only appealing to the public for any support for my son to be healed. His auntie also has this to say. The doctors are telling us that he has a problem with the spine and then he cannot move his body. He cannot move any part of the body. So we need an agent surgery so that uh, this thing can be corrected, so he can go about his mobile money business. As a family are trying so hard, raising the money, so much money that we need help from uh, the people of Ghana to come to su support us. Prince is a hard-working guy who is taking care of a whole family, so we beg you Ghanaians, please come to our aid. The family says it has raised just about half of the amount required to buy the items for the surgery. Prince could hardly make any audible speech as I tried to pick a word from him. Peter Sanu for Joy News. Now, district assemblies in the Upper West region have put in place stringent measures coupled with government's ban on the cutting and transporting of rosewood. Um, now, but in spite of this, the practice is still ongoing in some parts of the region. The felling of rosewood and its transportation was at its zenith in 2012, forcing the government to place a ban on its salvaging, cutting and transportation. Joy News' Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafiq Salam reports the rare species, which takes about 100 years to fully mature, are being cut into pieces by some unscrupulous persons for export. On the 8th of September 2020, when Joy News visited the Dodipapasi community to speak to residents about their expectations. According to the Environmental Investigation Agency report, 
About 6 million rosewood trees have been cut down in Ghana for illegal export to China since 2012. Despite government's ban and further tightening other loopholes on the illegal trade and felling of the endangered species, the practice still goes on. The personalities fingered in the act are corrupt government officials and local authorities. The illegal felling of rosewood in the Upper West region could best be described as hide and seek. Here, the illegal loggers find a district or an outlandish community to ply their trade. When their sins are being exposed, they could go on the quiet and move to another community to continue with their nefarious activities. Member of Parliament for the Wild West constituency, Superintendent retired Peter Lanchino Tubu, whose constituency he claimed the practices on the rise is deeply worried to the Maru. I got into the forest, I saw beautiful trees that were cut down and I just began to see a desert that is moving faster downwards than ever before and I'm asking if this is what we are going to leave for future generations then we have been we should be doing harm to the future than we have our grandfathers have done for us you, the, the, the level of detection will tell you the level of spread but until you see it you may think that it's at a particular level but it may be more than that or less than that my interest is the fact that this is an illegality and it must stop. The World West District Assembly in 2018 arrested these rosewoods that were illegal cut in some communities in the district and dumped at the Wichita Police Station. World West District Chief Executive Edward Labido Sobo agreed Hukulan and Senka with Superintendent Peter Lanchido Tubu on the illegal practice. However, he said it is difficult to fight it because the people are not ready to devour information to enable the security arrest the perpetrators. So I deployed the police and the, the military people to the scene. Uh, when they got there, they were not able to see anybody. They found out from the communities. They were not willing to show them the area that the people are actually doing the operations. They set search around that area they patrol there about two, three days. They haven't heard anything. So the operation they are doing there, they, it is that they have stopped. They have run away. Even as a nun, to identify the spot, those people that have been able to know the place, when you ask them to, to lead you there, they don't really want to go. They will only be uh, sending information across. But when you contact the person that where is actually that area, it becomes a challenge. Since the practice was done on the quiet and on the blind side of most of the people, the team therefore went on the prowl, driving from one district to the other, looking for communities where this illegal felon of the rosewood is taking place. When we bump into these 10 pieces of rosewood dumped by the roadside at Paradebu, we knew we were about hitting our target. We managed to meander our way through the forest, which was fast depleting because of the activities of the illegal loggers and on a bumpy inaccessible route to get to the Kajukuri enclave. Now join us on Wednesday, May 5, as Joy News, your home of fearless, credible and independent journalism partners, the Environmental Investigation Agency on the Joy Forum to engage stakeholders in the environment to dialogue on hashtag Save Rosewood Ghana. It's live on this platform, join 99.7 FM and myjoyonline.com, plus all our social media platforms. It's at 10 a.m. prompt. Joining us via Zoom is a campaigner for the West and Southern Africa focal point of the Environmental Investigation Agency based in the USA, Kidan Arya. Welcome to The Pulse, Kidan. Um, why are you at the EIA worried about the illegal rosewood trade in Ghana? Thank you for having me. Uh, EIA is deeply concerned since we work all over the world to preserve forests and our campaign to protect forests from increasing illicit trade is of the utmost importance, which is why we're so concerned with what's happening in Ghana. Despite five generations of bans on the harvest and trade of the species, protected rosewood is still being traded at high rates. We are not talking about a small amount of rosewood that is leaving the country. We are talking about millions of US dollars worth of rosewood that's being traded out of Ghana each month. 
It made front page news in Ghana earlier this year that 5.6 million U.S. dollars worth of illegal rosewood was exported from Ghana into China in December 2020 alone. This level of illegality should not be happening, particularly in a country known for its strong democratic governance in West Africa. And this particular rosewood in Ghana is protected by international authorities due to its endangered status. At the rate of the current illegal rosewood trade, it is not unreasonable to say that the species faces extinction in Ghana. We are in the middle of a global climate crisis, illegal deforestation of forests, forests which are critical in absorbing harmful carbon emissions, can accelerate climate change in Ghana, a country that is already disproportionately affected by climate change and at increased risk of decertification in the years to come. So leaders in Ghana have also expressed concern, especially leaders in northern Ghana, that if the rosewood is gone, rivers will dry up, soil erosion will occur, livelihoods could be lost. So these are not small issues. It's mm. worrisome and it must stop. Mm. Uh, very worrisome, Kidan. So what's your expectation in terms of what stakeholders must do to practically stop the trade of rosewood? Yeah, well, we believe that most stakeholders want to see an end to this illegal trade. There needs to be a re-energized, targeted strategy and stronger political will to do something different this time. It is quite simply not enough to ban the trade of rosewood. Time and time again, it has shown that bans can be ineffective when not enforced, and it's easy for timber traffickers to work around them. And one key issue that many Ghanaian stakeholders have flagged already is that people do not understand how all of this rosewood is leaving the country despite the ban. We hope the Joy Forum on Rosewood that we are partnering with you on will provide much needed space for experts from government, civil society, law enforcement and communities to come together and discuss the rosewood trade and what is at stake for Ghana if the illegal rosewood trade is not uh, if it ends. And so we need to figure out what can be done in terms of policy actions, enforcements and stopping the leakages, uh, and the further policy weaknesses that enable this trade to happen, despite its illegality. The issue is not just an issue for Ghana, it's a global issue, and stakeholders should employ the cooperation of Chinese authorities, international authorities to stop the trade on all fronts. And if Ghana was to declare a zero export quota, the problem would soon cease to exist. So mm. Ghana has an incredible opportunity to seize this moment and not just be a leader in West Africa, but also the world and letting the uh, legal rosewood trade end in this country and letting everyone know that Ghana will not stand for this illicit trade. It sounds um, very direct and very doable, uh, I must say. But uh, I was personally surprised to hear you say that 5.6 million was lost at the beginning of the year. Um, because I've been following the story that EIA has been doing from as far back as 2019. Um, what would you say to people who doubt if the harvest of rosewood is still happening in the country? Is it still happening in the country now? Yeah, I would say look at the data. Uh, so actually EIA is now tracking the status of the rosewood trade on our website on a monthly basis and it changes each month. So actually everyone watching live can pull out their electronic device and type in www.rosewoodrevealed.org. And on this website, you can see the most updated statistics that we have on how much rosewood is being exported from Ghana into China each month. So if you actually go to the site right now, we see that international trade data tells us that China declared in their customs about 1.8 million US dollars worth of rosewood in February 2021. Uh, that was imported from Ghana. So it's clear that the leakages, weak enforcement of the ban and corruption enabling the trade that EIA exposed in our report in 2019 still have not been fully resolved. And there's limited transparency and traceability of how this rosewood is actually leaving the country and entering Asian markets, where this rosewood, by the way, is used to make high-end, often expensive furniture items. And the trade occurs while Ghanaian rural communities and the people of Ghana receive little to no benefits due to taxes not being paid on illegal items and the rosewood being taken against the will of many of the community's wishes. And we have heard traditional leaders, for example, in the Savannah region, uh, count this over and over again. So we hope the week, this week that the event will make a difference.
Mm. When you say you, you hope the event will make a difference this week, what specifically are you expecting to achieve? I mean, are we expecting to achieve uh, with the Joy Forum taking place on Wednesday? Yeah, I think we need fresh ideas and renewed commitment to ending the illegal trade of rosewood in Ghana. We commend the government of Ghana for installing a ban on rosewood. But as the recent data shows, it is clearly not enough. And we saw a few weeks ago the current Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, uh, Mr. Samuel Ginapur, say that he is displeased with the level of illegality in the rosewood trade. And I think many of us, including Ghanaian public as well, are displeased as well. And we need stakeholders working together to ensure that laws protecting rosewood are upheld and enforced. And we also hope this event ignites further public conversation and visioning for what committed leadership on a national level could look like to end the rosewood trade in Ghana. Ghana is deemed as a shining example of good governance and democracy in Africa. There is no place for this high level of licit timber trade here. So what would it look like beyond the ban to save rosewood in Ghana? These are the questions that we hope the event will ask. And for years, Ghanaian civil society have put different solutions forward, such as ending salvage permits for rosewood. Uh, during EIA's undercover investigation in 2019, traffickers told us that salvage permits enabled them to take advantage of the system to procure illegal rosewood under the guise that it is salvaged, when in actuality, it was freshly cut under illegal circumstances. So it is time to focus on real and tangible solutions that can be implemented in Ghana, mapping out the ideas, mapping out implementation plan to stop the illegal rosewood trade once and for all. And by salvaged, just for the, for the sake of those viewers who may not understand, you're referring to the fact that it was legal in Ghana for you to sell rosewood logs which had been left there, um, which had already been cut. And you can just say, I'm salvaging them, as opposed to people cutting them freshly from the forest. Right. There's, um, there's, a, uh, there's a permit in Ghana that uh, at one point that if, a, for example, if a rosewood tree had fallen down or had already been cut, that someone could take it legally um, because they were not freshly cutting it. So many traffickers told EIA that they're using that uh, to uh, work around the system when in actuality they are freshly cutting the rosewood, unfortunately. Thanks, Kiran, for joining us this afternoon on The Pulse. And remember, the Joy Forum is live on this portal at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, May 5. Live on the polls, let's move to other issues having to do with our climate. The current food system is at a crossroad worldwide. There is a strong need for transforming food production and consumption patterns in a much more sustainable way. One where farmers adapt and build resilience to the increasing challenges from climate change and where nutritious food is available for all. As a result, the Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Organizational Development, together with the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana and other partners, are championing the adoption of agroecology as a means of ensuring food security and ending climate change. My colleague Anna Sabit has more in the following report. Opakwa Joe James is the founder of the Sustainable Livelihood Institute, a social entrepreneurship center specialized in organic farming permaculture activities, as well as training and mentoring of the youth. On the same piece of land, James, who started with only mushroom farming, currently has various varieties of crops coupled with livestock farming. Before, we were doing only mushrooms. But as time goes by, we realized that we could add, you know, other sustainable livelihood activities to it. And so we incorporated uh, li uh, livestock quail farming, ducks, or rabbits, or snails, and beehives. The motive behind blending livestock with the crop farming, according to James, is to build a combined local and scientific farming system that focuses on the interactions between plants, animals, humans, and the environment. James a leading producer of mushroom in the Bono East region says farming through agroecology is effective and cheap to operate. And contrary to a general perception that agroecology is expensive and earns the farmer little in terms of produce and income, James says agroecology is a lucrative venture. 
they have very good orientation about agroecology. You see that it's cheap to operate. And, then, and in the long run, it's sustainable. Mushroom is very creative, depending on how you do it. If you do it well, my brother, I don't think if they offer you any job anywhere, you want to do it. You want to do mushroom. An agroecological approach includes a number of agricultural methods, such as diversification of crops, conservative tillage, green manures, natural fertilizers, biological pest control, and production of crops and livestock in ways that stores carbon and protect the forest. Mr. Bernard Guri is the executive director of the Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Organizational Development. Agroecology, as it says, is farming with nature, where you don't cut off your trees, you grow your crops together with the trees, in terms of the soil management, you don't go and put chemicals inside, you put manure into a soil. And then in that way, they are able to produce to feed the community and still have surplus that can feed the country. The center is currently promoting the adoption of agroecological farming for farmers in the Bono East region. Mr. Bernard Guri believes that the current farming style is negatively affecting the ozone layer, thereby contributing to climate change. The so-called industrial agriculture that we talk about, that we think is better and will feed the country, is actually promoting climate change. And also promotes the use of a lot of fertilizers. And these fertilizers are chemicals that, is, that go off into the air and affect the ozone layer, which is actually protecting the environment and it, it, it keep your temperature low. He says the surest way to solving the issue of global warming is to switch to agroecological farming. I think industrial agriculture is what is the highest contributor to global warming. And therefore, we, we, there's a need, an urgent need for an alternative. And the alternative is agroecology. One aspect which is rarely explored is the quality of food produced through agroecological farming systems compared to that of the industrial farming. James says organic foods last longer and tastes much better than inorganic foods. If you buy food from the market and they're organic, they last longer as compared to the inorganic method. For example, Paul, even our mushrooms, vegetables, we harvest them and keep them for months. And they don't go bad. So in terms of comparison, I don't think we even need to compare. Organic is super as compared to inorganic. And it's cheaper as well. From the farms, we visited the Techiman Central Market to ascertain from these vegetable sellers the difference between organic and inorganic farming products in terms of quality and cost. Dokas Asidu has been into this trade for the past 25 years. <laughs> We have two varieties. These ones go waste after some few days, but these ones last up to a month because they are produced through organic means. It looks slim, but healthier than these ones. The well-educated always go for these ones, but the uneducated opt for these because they are cheaper. Dorcas appeals to farmers to switch to organic farming. According to her, the organic vegetables last longer and are healthier than the inorganic ones. All these vegetables have health benefits, but people are not buying now because of the chemicals used. So the farmers should reduce the use of chemicals on their farms. With consumers increasingly demanding healthy foods and policy makers like Secord calling for farming methods that promote environmentally friendly agriculture, there is the need for the consideration of agroecology as the surest option to end climate change. Reporting for Joy News, Anas Sabit, Tichiman. I am also a purposely designed engineering material. PHI 
created by combining single materials. Yes, Isaac. Composite. Composite. <laughs> I was reading the fifth clue, three points. At the end of the contest, here are the final four. Opokuari School has 21 points. Adesadel College has 31 points. Presec Legon has 36 points. Opokuari School, congratulations for making it all the way to the grand finale. You did well, but unfortunately, uh, anyway. At the Sadal College, congratulations to you also. Thank you for giving us a great contest. Unfortunately, you couldn't take the trophy, but you did well, you did very well. I'm happy to declare you second place. Preset Legon. Congratulations on winning the contest. Very well done. You have won the championship. I am pleased to congratulate you on your achievement as 2020 National Science and Math Quiz champions. Hooray! In the year 1995, and they were champions. In 2003, they were champions. In 2006, they were champions. In 2008, they were champions. In 2009, they were champions. And in 2020, Well, it's that time of the year again. New champions will emerge and the competition has begun. Four schools in the Greater Accra region have sealed their qualification for the finals of the National Science and Maths Quiz to happen later in October. West Africa Senior High School, Holy Trinity Cathedral, SHS and Olam SHS beat competition from their contenders to keep their hopes alive. Um, their hopes, of course, of clinching the trophy and winning the bragging rights as champions of science and maths competition in Ghana. Let's get more updates from our man Manuel Kranting, who himself is stationed in the Upper West Regional Capital, WA. He's bringing us some updates. Manuel, we understand that contests for the day have ended. Do we know yet the schools that have qualified for the national championships from the Upper West Region? So we are just in time to catch a few of the students who just competed in the last contest for the day. Well, four contests have gone down and there have been four winners. Um, what I can tell you though is that winning these four contests um, does not necessarily, you know, book a place for them in a national tournament. There's going to be a final decider tomorrow, um, which would then, um, you know, allow for the schools that have won today to be able to book um, five of the slots that have been reserved for the Upper West region. But right now though, the school of the moment is Laura SHS, and they have been able to, as it were, fight off opposition from um, schools like uh, St. Uh, Ignatius of Loyola, and then uh, also Nandom SHS. Well, Nandom SHS is one of the two uh, boys' schools in the Upper West region. Uh, they have been tipped to have actually been one of the favorites in the contest going ahead into it. Unfortunately, they had two distinct chances. Uh, you know, an opportunity that no other school um, in today's contest have been able to get. But they got all, uh, both of the, the, the chances. Well, unfortunate, uh, it seems today is just not their day. They squandered both chances. But let me start off um, the conversation um, this afternoon with the uh, quiz mistress. She's been at the home of affairs the entire day. Uh, Mrs. Gladys Schwinger, we, 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 we go all the way back to the University of Ghana. 
<laughs> Congratulations. It's been a great day uh, um, in the seat. How was it? Oh, it was very, it was very nice today. Seeing the school score with such good points, they finished the contest at least for the winners. Mm. They got high points, mostly beyond 40. Yeah. So that was yeah. good to see. Yeah. And, and there was a high point, really. The, the highest scoring school well, is a girl school. school. Yeah. Yes, St. Francis Girls Senior High School. The girls really impressed me. They were confident. Mm. They were confident and they were very vocal in their answers. I was very impressed with their performance. They got 52 points. They scored the highest today in the Upper West region. And, and, and that is something that we're looking to replicate. Of course, they are the only girls' school competing from the Upper West region. But as we move our, along from the Upper West to other regions, also, we're looking to see more and more female schools participate the more, correct? Yes, we are hoping more female schools will join. And since they haven't truly qualified for Accra, I'm praying tomorrow they put up a similar performance to get the opportunity to come for the national competition and I'm looking, once they get there, I know they'll get far. And that's the general bias speaking. <laughs> <laughs> but, but of course, I mean, we're all looking forward to seeing more and more females participate in these competitions. Yes. But I mean, while you were on the podium, I saw a few schools protesting a few of the uh, answers that you had ruled out and so on. I mean, it wasn't a victory for you? That was so unfortunate. They weren't supposed to do that. They were to leave those to their teachers to go and contest. But well, what they are not aware is that they are not aware of the fact that I write every school's answer down. I see. So whatever you tell me at the end of the contest, I can tell who told me what. So they had given me answers, and when the final answer came out, they were like, that was what we said. And it wasn't anything they had said. And that's, that should be so much writing, but, but I mean, going away from today, I just want to pick finally your appraisal of their performance, all the, uh, what, 16 schools, or uh, like or 12 schools that competed, because three yeah, schools, schools. No, ordered, actually 11. Okay, because one school did twice. Yes. Okay, great, great. Well, well, well tell, tell me, what, what is your expectation for tomorrow? Uh, for the last two contests of the day, I expect very exciting contests because I can see the fire in them. Each school wants to get there. Well, let's, let's leave a lot of the talk for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Gladys Ringa is the quiz mistress. She's been at the helm of affairs. Thank you very much, Madam. Let me now talk to uh, some of the students. Well, come over. Come over. The Laura, the Laura Senior High School. These are the guys of the moment, Daniel, and they have been able to make it in the last slot for the day. I'll talk to them. Congratulations, guys. How's it feeling? Thank you, sir. How's it feeling? Well, people are very dull. Why? You, you, boy, you can't talk. We are feeling good. All of you can't talk. Yeah. Can't so what, 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 what's your response if I say Laura SHS? Simple. Simple. Oh, oh, among the best. OK, wait, let me, let me, let's, let's do it again. Laura SHS. Simple. Simple. Always oh, among the best. Wait, uh, it's very long. Before you finish saying, I'll, I'll get to Borga. But anyways, congratulations again. When you were on, on stage, I mean, there's Nandom and there was Loyola. These schools, I mean, they came for it. I yeah. spoke to them and they seemed really, really poised for it. Weren't you intimidated at all? Yeah, it wasn't easy, but it is by grace of God that we, we, we were able to okay. pass through. Were the questions difficult? Um, some of them were difficult, all right. Some of them were difficult? Yeah. But you were able to solve them? Yeah. There are more difficult ones coming tomorrow. Are you, are you prepared? Yeah, we are prepared by God's grace. You are prepared by God's grace. Well, th these are the students. Their trainer is here. What, what was the secret? Come, come closer. Come closer. What's the secret? I like, I like where, I like where your pen is. Very, very. <laughs> I look into the camera. <laughs> what was the secret in preparing? Oh, the secret is that we are always among the best, okay. and we always take our time to scrutinize all the topics, and see none of the school as a challenger. Okay. We always see them as people below us. So we don't take any context easy. Okay. We always start at a good. Uh, tempo in order to make it to the end. I see. Yes. Congratulations. We, 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 we are looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. And then finally, I speak to um, Nandom SHS. Oh, you trained them also? No, uh, that's my alma mater. Oh, I see. And so, you eventually beat them. <laughs> but quickly, quickly, let's do this quickly so that we can go back um, to, to Daniel. You, you, you competed twice. You got two chances. You didn't use them. What happened? Mm. Okay, every morning in his day. So today, I think today is just not our day at all. 
Today's not your day. Yes, please. But, but what are you going to do? Are you going to prepare and come back better? We've met Laura, that is four consecutive times, and we beat them all the four times. So they Wait beating us minutes. today is not something we are surprised of because we just know that today is not our day. Today is not your day. Actually, well, be, 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 better luck next time. You, what? We beat them all in the trials. So but, we but have something happened today. You don't understand, eh? Great. Anyways, let's finally speak to uh, Mr. Daniel. Say, great, great, sir. Uh, he is the trainer of St. Ignatius of Loyola. And he, earlier in the morning, told me that they were here uh, to win. Now, in 2019, this particular school was seeded going into the 2020 competition. They lost their seed um, in 2020, and they are starting from the originals. It didn't seem to be a, a good start for you, was exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah, I think uh, our expectations, we couldn't achieve them. But I think everything uh, is in the hands of God. They deserve it. They did better. Okay. Yeah. So what, what, are, you, are you looking forward to being one of the best losing performing schools? Not really. I don't think there's a chance for me again. And when you lose, you're out. Yeah. So it's the winners who compete for the five. So next year? Exactly. So we'll see you be bigger and better next year. Exactly. Congratulations. And even though you didn't win anything, all the best. We hope to see you next year <laughs> when we come back to Uwa. <laughs> and so Daniel, uh, from here at the um, Upper West Regional um, Library here in Uwa, it's, it's, it's the end of day one. And four schools have made their mark. And these schools, St. Francis of Assisi uh, Girls School, um, St. Francis Xavier um, Minor Seminary, Drapa SHS, and then of course the ones that we just spoke to, Laura SHS. These are the four schools that have won today's contest and they are elated going into tomorrow. We'll bring you more and more reactions as we pick the other um, right. competitions. Mm -hmm. Daniel, if you can hear me, back to you. Manuel, before you go, tell us what we should expect tomorrow. Well, so there are four other contests slated for tomorrow, Daniel, and these are just a regular contest of, uh, you know, the, the, the regional championship. These are qualifiers that will be held. And then after these uh, four qualifiers are held, the winners from those contests will join the winners from today's contest into a final qualifier. Now, out of that final qualifier, five schools are going to be chosen to represent the region um, in the national tournament in Accra. But even before that, there's a new introduction that, uh, you know, um, uh, um, the NSMQ team is bringing up this year, and it's the zonal competitions. And so in the northern zone, the five schools here are going to, the five schools which win from the uh, Upper West region are going to join other uh, um, schools from across the Northern Belt. I'm talking about the Savannah region, Upper East region, um, Northeast region, the, uh, the Savannah region, of course, the Northern region, together to compete in what we call the Northern Zone. Before even later, um, we see the uh, a national tournament in October. So really, it's, it's a power-packed um, set of activities that we're going to have even in the next couple of days as we travel around the, uh, uh, um, uh, around the country, really, to bring you nice details and pictures of how schools are preparing for the competition. And so, yes, we'll, we'll finally get to see right. your infant mm. pin, Daniel, <laughs> which is starting from the scratch anyways. <laughs> um, yes, yes, yes. Sometimes it's, we, we have to give everyone the opportunity to watch more infant spin competitions which is why we decided to start from regionals this time around. But all can take, thank you very much for joining us um, from what will be with you every step of the way. Let's come back to Accra. Maxwell Agbagba is on standby for us. Max, we understand the third contest for the day is underway. Which schools are slugging it out? And what has been the best performance so far? Well, uh, what is happening right now is the last contest um, for the day. Um, we had a third contest just about an hour ago and um, Olam Senior High School, Lady of Mercy Senior High School actually won that particular contest. So they are the third school to qualify from the greater Accra region um, for the national competition which will be taking place um, in October. Um, the first school to qualify was the Holy Trinity Cathedral Senior High School. They booked first place at the national competition in October. They beat competition from Adan Senior High School and Keshi Presby Senior High School. West Africa Senior High School, um, this time around, they had luck smiling um, at them because they beat them at secondary school, Kimbu Senior High Technical School, Now, West Africa Senior High School beat them at secondary school, 
with just one point um, qualified to the national competition. I remember um, West Africa Senior High School, what is memorable for many people is the performance that they put up in 2018 to got to the grand finale of the National Science and Math Quiz. Um, but they were, uh, I mean, um, St. Peter's, St. Peter's actually beat them with just one point to win the um, trophy for the 2018 um, competition. Well, today, uh, they seem to have repeated that against another school. They beat them at uh, secondary school with just one point to qualify to the um, national competition, which will be happening in October. Now, in all 34 schools will be taking part in this regional qualifiers, nine winning schools will make it to the national competition. They will join the four seeded schools from the greater Accra region, making it 13 the national competition um, in October. So right about now, we have our last contest for the day um, taking place uh, in just some minutes. So mm. we'll have the results for that contest um, declared. And then we'll wait for tomorrow's contest uh, to also start. And then we see uh, what left for national science and math is here in the greater Accra region. Bank. Thank you very much, Maxwell Agbagba, for joining us here from Accra. It sounds so exciting already. And we will be with you every step of the way as we follow the competition. Before I let Maxwell go, though, uh, Max, tell us what are the expectations for tomorrow? Well, a lot of the people we've been speaking to um, are very optimistic that we are going to lift the 2021 trophy. Um, the contestants from West Africa Secondary School I spoke to actually made a reference to their 2018 performance. Um, they say that they're going to do um, very well. They think they'll get to the grand finale. Uh, there are many um, pessimists uh, who think that it's quite a long journey from now um, to the grand you know, um, finale. And they think that for the National Science and Math Quiz, it is, it is difficult to actually rely right. on your past mm. because you all come into the game with, with, mm. with what you have. You can't mm. rely on what has happened in the past to say that you're going to win the competition. But the guys from uh, 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 West Africa Technical School, they are very optimistic that they are going to win the 2021 contest. The same applies to all the schools um, that won today's competition. Only Right, Maxwell, it's getting a bit difficult to hear you, but um, we will connect with you for more updates later. Maxwell, like back there, man from Accra, you're live on the Pulse. We'll be right back. Many thanks for joining us. This has been the Pulse with me, Daniel Daze. Happy. Um, they, uh, happy Labor Day to all workers who are watching us as well. We're going to take a few messages, and when we come back, it's sports. But remember, for more news, log on to myjoyonline.com.